I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of uh, Retention as a Service Agency Electric. Uh, and today I'm talking with Wesley Magnus. So I hope I didn't mess up that last night. Mm-hmm. There we go. Um, He's a multi-time founder, focused on software. Uh, I met him probably a couple of years ago now through Electric SMS, which then got acquired by uh, Recharge uh, back in 2020. And now he's overseeing all of the R&D initiatives uh, over at Recharge, who's obviously one of Electric's uh, closest uh, partners. So really excited to have you on here and uh, chat through some some really hot topics. Yeah, it's, it's so funny when I was thinking before this podcast, I was like, you were the first agency that I ever interacted with, period, in my life. Really? And yeah. And it was electric SMS and electric, which I always called electric IQ. Um, <laughs> and, as, did and a just, so, as did a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, it works, right? Um, and it was just so funny. They were like, wait, does electric IQ run electric SMS? I was like, basically, like, <laughs> you, guys, you guys knew how to set everything up. Um, so yeah, it's been a while, man. Thanks for having me on the podcast. So before we, uh, jump into some things here, can you give everybody listening just quick TLDR on, on yourself, what you're, what you did, what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so born on the East coast in Delaware, first job was actually serving coffee to Joe Biden, which is fun. And Jill, Jill and Joe, um, Moved out to New York to start my sort of entrepreneurial career, which was honestly just a series of failures. Um, did some cool stuff though, then e com or sorry, marketplaces, ed tech, like you mentioned, and then actually got really inspired by augmented reality. I was one of those people that was like, this is it. This is the final frontier. This is how we're going to start to interact with computers. I'm no longer going to stare at my phone. And so I moved out to LA because it had this perfect threshold of computer graphics through Hollywood, but then video games. And so I got really inspired and moved out here. Um, And all of that completely washed away, right? I think people realized pretty quickly that the world isn't ready for VR, AR, and Facebook's now finally realizing that, meta, I mean. And um, I ended up getting into just very pragmatic software development. um, And I had a roommate who was building a CPG company. She's amazing. Her name's Sarah Collin. She runs Gem. And she would just stay up late trying to figure out how to help her customers log into their recharge customer portals. And that was honestly where this all took off. I just wanted to solve her problem because she was keeping me up. And it turned into what is a, a great exit and kind of has defined, I think, the majority of my professional career so far. So um that's a long-winded way of saying primarily driving innovations efforts at recharge uh secondarily i think i've taken a good step back and can like philosophically map all my experiences to what i think will be an incubation model um that will help other and support other founders and then third uh this might seem like a joke but i'm serious about this one i'm looking for dj mixes all the time like <laughs> really good DJ mixes so I can blend them into my my work flow and, and get into it. Um, so if by any chance someone out there knows of a great mix, send I it. Have, I have a lot of SoundCloud mixes for you. I'll have to send them to you. But I need to I need to like what type of music you like to listen to as well. No. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, definitely a lot of house right now. This guy Move D does deep house mixes and it's phenomenal. I'm going to have to add them to my, to my roll decks. I actually, I like working on the weekends now because like I can actually listen to music because yeah, the work week, I'm just on calls the whole time. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. I miss, I miss the you early days both. of electric. <laughs> I miss the early days of electric when nobody gave a shit about us or wanted to talk to me. And like every day was just maybe one call at best but i was just working and listening to music and like in the groove and yeah now i've got like 34 slacks and 100 emails and i'm just like (laughs) typing and it's just a nightmare 
Yeah. Technically, that's music, but just you don't like listening to it. <laughs> People's voices. <laughs> I just any call with more than like X amount of people on it, or where like I don't even say a word. I'm like, why am I on this call? Like, it just oh, doesn't make sense. No, so. I just e eject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, what are you? What are you currently working on? Um, at mm -hmm. Recharge. Yeah. Have you heard of this um, term or concept called minescence? I have not until. I saw the intake form that you filled out. Yeah, yeah. No, I hadn't either. And then even in like referencing it, I had to Google it to just double check on the definition. And it doesn't even really pop up. What does pop up is this group called the Minescence Group that does this values intake and exercise. And I think it's really important to um, revisit your values at a fairly consistent rate, like every year and a half, two years, et cetera. Cause they change, but they don't change too much. Like they usually just shift around their hierarchies. And I hope, I hope um, this group knows what I'm talking about. And if not, we can throw things in the show notes. But anyways, Minescence um, was introduced again by that values framework that I did with my good friends and partners in uh, another category of work that I'm doing. And it means to, and I'll just look it up, miniaturize and simplifies complex ideas or technology into concrete and practical applications for the purpose of creatively enhancing society. <clears throat> so pretty damn good definition, actually. And that is what I've been up to for the past nine months, almost on the dot at Recharge. Um, we have seen a pretty serious need for a bundling come up in the past nine months or even prior to that. But in the past nine months, we knew that this is the time that we were going to start to automate um, a, a lot of different processes that business owners do for retention and their entire commerce experience. So um, we're building what we're calling recharge flows. It's very much like the Zapier, Shopify flow, um, Alloy in some ways. We're building out an entire product line for that. Um, with opinionated recipes that we know work really well for commerce experiences, like gifting someone something on an order, um, churn prevention, if someone's actively churning, et cetera. We have leveraged our entire data set to know what is the most important templates that we need in flows, but we've also built out what is a really great, what would we call it? It's, it's like um, a collection of primitives that are triggers conditions and actions that a merchant can can determine and take to then create very customized um, experiences for their customers. So it's been pretty crazy. Um, and we could dive deeper into it. And you and I actually will continue to do that, given that we work together. But um, yeah, how, how we got here and why this makes sense and kind of taking a step back has been what I've been thinking a lot about lately. Um, so maybe we can get into that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think is, what do you think are the driving factors behind the need for, uh, bundling? And then, yeah, I guess my second question to that would be, how are you handling it? Um, something I've been asking like all of our tech partners, because historically we'd have like 15 apps, each one would do one thing and they'd like <laughs> integrate with each other. But now mm -hmm. Each of these 15 apps is creating products that the other one of the other 15 apps is doing. And so how do you mm -hmm. manage that? Because you obviously like it, it's messy. Um, so yeah. there are two questions. Yeah. It's very messy. And we noticed that, like, again, we have just so many merchants that we can look at and see how messy it really is under the hood. And it's messy. There's <laughs> like 15 to 18 apps on average, right? Um, it's been in a store and, 95, 95 apps. What? I'm not even making it up. It's because <laughs> if you, if you really dig deep into the Shopify app store, there is an app yeah. for literally everything. I mean, yeah. address validation and checkout. There's an app for that. Like little, you just sort of go on down the list and you could app your way to 90 apps pretty reasonably if you're somebody <laughs> with your technical capabilities or expertise and like you just yeah. want to, you want to do things. Um, but anyway. 99 apps and <laughs> yeah, it's, 
it's pretty crazy. We we started realizing the need for consolidation, not just because people have a ton of apps, but because of this massive value chain disruption that happened with Apple, their IDFA policy with Facebook, which just made it harder to get net new customers in. Um, it just started to create what is always usually the trigger for something, um, somewhat of a crisis, like people's business models were changing. They're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I need to now focus more on retention and conversion rate optimization. But no, no longer am I just like pumping cash into, you know, ads for acquisition. I actually now need to like change this, this up quite a bit. And whenever something happens fairly quickly, it's like you turn real fast. And then suddenly you're, you're like, wait, where am I? <laughs> and then imagine you're like, you know, a pilot in a, or maybe you're just a captain of a ship and there's all these other buttons and things in the cockpit. And you're like, shit, what do I do? <laughs> like, I, I haven't had to do anything in a while. It was kind of like steering and like stepping on the gas pedal. Now I've got to like press all these buttons. And so um, that was kind of the, the genesis of why we, we saw this need for consolidation. It's usually like, again, a technological shift, an economic shift, or um, a cultural one. And this one is very much like a technical shift, literally Apple making it so much harder for you to target your customers. And so, yeah, the cost of acquisition increased and, and therefore the um, amount of value that you need to put into retention increased and then the importance of ease of use increased as well. Uh, what's also super cool about this time, I guess, within e is that there's a lot of sophisticated point solution products out there. Like all those apps, I'm guessing that they do what they do fairly well, you know? And what that means is that a lot of patterns, especially when I look at how to start building something, a lot of patterns already exist. Like it's not about doing something net new all the time, right? It's about looking at what is being done and what's being done extremely well. And then pulling back and saying, well, how does this map to what we're capable of doing? Um, and so that is what really spurred the consolidation around things is realizing, holy shit, a lot of people just took a sharp turn. Their business models are changing. There's also macroeconomic headwinds happening and people are just freaking out. So the need for just simpl simplicity, a single lens of truth in which you can operate from, clean pane of glass, hands on the steering wheel, gas, brake, like that's all you really need. You need like four things. You don't need, you know, all different levers and kinds of stuff right now. Um, and then also it's worth mentioning, I'm someone who like, I guess, started my career in doing a lot of um, object-oriented programming with just APIs, right, and payment solutions and stuff. And I was always able to like pull things off the shelf as a developer and be like, oh, this is awesome. Um, it's gotten even, not, I don't want to say easier, but now there's no code solutions out there for everything. So I only bring that up because it's like we realized that the need for total customization um, is not no longer really necessary. Like opinionated frameworks and products are actually doing really well right now because again, people don't want to think too much. They just want to, they just want to like step on the gas and try right. a little bit. That's how I feel about smart appliances. Um, yeah, <laughs> my new place. I was like. Some things don't have to be smart. Like, I don't want to be able to like turn on my toilet with my phone. It just sounds like <laughs> it's going to break. And now I have like this stupid thing I have to deal with that just now I can't even put It's so funny. Yeah. There's, there's got to be like some meme somewhere where it's like a smart toaster or something like it won't work. And it's like a dad who just totally. wants to put his toast in the, in the toaster. And it's just like so funny. <laughs> but it makes a lot of sense. And I came from like, when I first started electric, we were all HubSpot. Oh, yeah. I was really bought into the idea of this all in one hub for everything, where you could have all yeah. the customer data, you could have the ability to create like unique website experiences for customers based off of the data you had in your CRM, it was all integrated together, they had the CMS, mm -hmm. they had the CRM, they had the sales hub, they had the marketing hub. Um, they never really got around to making it work for e-commerce though, which is why I sort of had to rip the bandaid off and go all in on this best in class approach with individual apps that all integrate together. But like yeah. that spot model for me, 
is way simpler, works way better for electric. It's mm -hmm. totally the only like software solution we use for the most part, unless you look at like Slack or Crossbeam or like monday.com. Mm -hmm. But our tech stack is so simple compared to what you see with, uh, with like an e-commerce brand uh, nowadays. Yeah. And there's always, again, it's like desire for humans or I don't know, individuals to like, they don't think they're complicating things. They think they're optimizing, but then it's like, you open up their medicine cabinet and you're like, oh my God, like you got like 30 different types of pills, right? You've got like all these mushroom blends and, that, and you're like, this doesn't seem right. And then you have these people on the other spectrum that are just like, just like, um, drinking whole milk you know <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't really know which one of these works but i'm just gonna stay in the middle here and just not do the electric toaster just yeah. stick to like maybe maybe a good fridge you know yeah. <laughs> I don't, so we're hoping to be that like smart fridge right we're like this makes sense it tells me when i'm running low on stuff keeps things cold and freezing and doesn't smell bad this is what i want <laughs> how, how are you dealing with um because I'm sure some of the products uh, as a part of this bundling effort are not going to be subscription only. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm assuming a lot of the architecture and just the way Recharge has thought about things up until a certain point was all around subscriptions. So what does mm -hmm. that process look like? Um, That's a good question. I mean, what was really cool and why um, I, I don't want to say like I decided to be acquired by Recharge. It was just like there was just full alignment like it almost was just I don't know um somewhat destined but part of what made it so attractive to me was how Mike and Oshin the founders they created like a payment processor a shipping rate and tax calculation uh service like they created an entire like little e-com app right and so they actually still do have the ability to track one-time purchases and not even just subscriptions like they un they understand the whole concept of what is very simple actually at the end of the day customers products orders like that whole thing like recharge has as a standalone um as standalone data objects what happened recently with like shopify releasing their um their subscriptions api is that it just made it a lot easier for a lot of other companies to start creating or mapping onto those same objects but recharge itself has that entire silo of like a data model where it's like customers orders and products um and so when we were thinking about the term of like minescence and taking all this super complicated stuff and then simplifying it into like a single product we were like well we have those primitives we really do so we're gonna focus on what we do well which is subscriptions Right. And then we can do things like gifting someone on a specific order number, um, conditional splits on those customers so that we're only giving people whose birthdays are in this month a gift. Uh, we could also A-B test the gift itself. So we can see like, all right, we're going to send 90% of these people gift A and then 10% of people gift B. Um, and then we kind of like put that to the side a little bit. Like we still are building that and focusing quite a bit on it. But we still have this huge data model where it's like, all right, we still just have products, customers, and, and orders. Um, yeah. How do we now map those that similar thing, like trigger conditions and actions to different services, like memberships, right? Rewards and like store credit. How do we do that? And then even one times, right? Like how can we start to do, okay, well, this person bought product A within time frame Z, that means that after X amount of time, we should remind them to reorder that product and then offer them what they <clears throat> were promoted to, to buy at the end of that, that interval to give them like a free gift as a one-time purchase. Like we could do that just as well. Um, so the really cool thing about recharge is how we're able to just look at the entire commerce experience not just subscriptions and with again those same primitives of trigger conditions and actions map different strategies onto any type of of uh, product line again memberships subscriptions yeah. one times etc i think um you are in 
a really strong position in place to be able to do that because of like your initial inroads into the e-commerce ecosystem, which was subscriptions. And so like the way I've been looking at some of our tech partners is like, if I'm a solution that's more of like a nice to have, it's going to be a lot harder to make inroads to the more like crucial core products, like an email yeah. product or subscriptions or things like that. Whereas for recharge, it's very easy to then not easy. I don't want to marginalize it, but it's like, yeah. it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot easier sell to clients. And you're also positioning, you're, you're operating from more of a position of power and influence than necessarily like a, a tool that you would pull off the shelf and like to sort of plug in somewhere on your Shopify storefront. Totally. Yeah. It's the difference between like a supplement and a painkiller. That's just one thing. Like there's a painkiller. And then we have pro product distribution fit, right? Like people uh, think a lot about like product market fit, but a much bigger thing, especially right now is whether or not you have distribution, right? Like it's, it's a little, you can, you, you don't have as much friction, you know, trying to then deploy the new products into um, their user base. So I think size matters a lot too, because what I think would be really cool is for like a recharge. I'm sure I'm, uh, in 20 or 30 like recharge individual store yeah. accounts as a customer so like mm -hmm. when i go to that 31st store to make a subscription purchase or a one-time purchase like why can't recharge use my past behavior from the other 30 stores to inform the experience mm -hmm. that i get on like that 31st store and mm -hmm. that's something that a smaller company can't do because they don't have the scale or data to be able to leverage to create some sort of a model that would that would do something like that. I think companies like yeah. Rebuy could do it as well because Rebuy is on so many damn Shopify stores. Like, why is the tenth, the tenth Rebuy store that I land on use yeah. my behavior from the previous nine to help improve the conversion rate on that tenth store? And then you get like more network effects, and that's how you get more merchants on. Like, I think that's why Shop Pay and all these Shop products are so powerful is because of the mm -hmm. fact that the more customers that use it, the more valuable it becomes for the merchants, the more merchants that are using it, the more customers. And it's this sort of network effect that yeah. lifts all parties that are in the walled garden. But if you're outside of it, you're screwed. Um, totally. you, don't have to shop it. you don't have these things. And so customers are going to gravitate towards where it's more seamless and, and, and frictionless. But there's still so yeah. much shit that's done like manually by me or by the agency that's just stupid like building audiences in clavio and running these tests. <laughs> like we're just like we're just making these tests up um why is, why is clavio not telling me you should send this type of email at this time to this customer with this type of content like i've got to be in a hundred plus clavio email list at this point they should know what i'm going to click on like why aren't we taking the way that like a tiktok algorithm works to just like suck me into the damn thing <laughs> and use that in like the email marketing product. Yeah. Oh, that's I'm, not, very I'm, not, well I'm not smart enough to figure it out, but like, I think that'd be a great future state if somebody else wants to go in and make that happen. Well, yeah. And it is happening again. I think that's what's so always fascinating about e-com is that, you know, when you look at that technology, generally speaking, they are always kind of pushing on these like network effects. Like, we're using a technology or have started using a technology that Uber came up with. Um, you can look it up. And again, like not saying this is actually being used, but um, temporal or cadence, it's like a workflows orchestration system. And they realized with their network effect of, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of drivers, all with these individual logistics and patterns around it, that they needed to figure out how to orchestrate the state of each of those drivers individually, even though it was, massive right and so that means if you're getting dropped off across the street and then a driver just turned on to then pick up someone else and um the driver that's dropping you off just wants to go home that they shouldn't pick me up the person who just signed on is actually going to pick me up like all these little micro decisions happening at scale and it's yeah. crazy because that's how tech and like big tech thinks is they think about how to then leverage the data that they get and those network effects to make even more productive value. And with recharge, actually, that was one of the things that at one point I almost had to gripe about because we just have so much um, 
uh, data about, you know, purchase behavior and churn behavior, right? Like we know when people are likely going to cancel or we have at least again, like a confidence gradient on that. And so, yeah, one of the first things we did at Electric SMS after the acquisition into recharge was like, cool, let's make this cancellation experience dynamic. I don't want Brandon just even after two years of subscribing to me, canceling and just saying goodbye <laughs> versus Wesley, yeah. who's only had the product for a month, you know? And so we did what was like a smart charge reminder. We had the idea that you were likely going to cancel. And then we piped in all your LTV data and purchase behavior and said, well, this person has you know, spent over $3,000 with you. If they say cancel or they're going to say canceled, what do you want to do? Like, how do you want to intervene? And mm -hmm. what we ended up doing was including a gift or a discount on the order before you even had the chance to cancel, right? And that, again, was over a year ago. And we actually never ended up releasing it um, broadly into general availability. But that's the kind of stuff that we're now doing within Flows. Like we're exposing that information about your own customers so that you can predictably take action on them to increase LTV. And that's just where it's like, yeah, that's, that's not something that many other people can do too, you know? Um, so when that's, when that's happening, you have to lean into that hard. Um, so yeah, fun stuff like that. So is that one of the, like talking about your sort of career arc, um, is that size and scale of recharge something that was appealing to you as like as an acquisition opportunity? And I guess like to step back even further, when you started recharge SMS, like and you were in the thick of things, did you even think of selling or like what was your what was your vision if you had not sold to recharge? And like totally. Yeah, I haven't actually thought about that in a while, but just, like first things first, absolutely no idea it was gonna get acquired. Like when I got the email from Oshin, which is funny, like you could look it up. Sometimes his email comes across as Bear Supplements. It's like his first test store. So I got this email from Bear Supplements. I still get like, emails hey. from Bear Supplements every month that my order's <laughs> coming. I don't know which store I set it up with, but it's like <laughs> comical. But it was so comical. I was like, oh wait, it almost felt like a Nigerian Prince thing, you know? Um, yeah. I was like, oh man, I'm getting hacked or something. And then I got actually even more scared. I was like, oh, shit, I found a recharge. <laughs> and I had been building it um, electric so that we could also work with Recurly and other subscription providers. And then yeah. we also were working purely with Shopify because I wanted to do one-time orders with reorders via SMS. Um, so when I got the email, I actually had, I, my first instinct was like, he's cutting off my API access. Uh, I probably <laughs> made a huge mistake. And he... <laughs> And instead he was like, no, I'm like 10 minutes away. Let's go for a walk. And um, we ended up just talking about World of Warcraft for like an hour, you know? <laughs> he just wanted to understand more about like how I ended up, you know, building electric, what I thought about their APIs. And I, I just continued to think like, oh man, like I'm probably, and this was before the Series B fundraising and everything. Like I still saw it as like a fairly big company, but not like a unicorn or anything. Um, and I just felt an alignment. I don't know how else to put it. It just felt like I, as someone who dropped out of school and never really had like um, someone that I could learn from like deeply at a really high caliber, like it was a really good opportunity in that. But then more so we talked about, we did think it would be like a great future of, of commerce. And that was one of the things that I was really excited about if I did start or continue with electric. I wanted it to just be like a dynamic shopping experience, you know, whether or not I was someone that likes to just one-time purchase and reorder, subscribe, whatever, we would have some way of giving the merchant the ability to create a workflow. It's a really popular word these days, but a workflow that has a trigger condition and an action where it's like Brandon bought lemon poppy. People who buy lemon poppy on their second order like to swap to blueberry muffin, you know? And so what we're going to do is recommend on that second order that he swaps to blueberry muffin. Um, and then we would see that that would, you know, end up increasing LTV. And he was totally aligned. Um, he, if anything, just seemed like he needed, or not needed, but desired the level of like, mm, almost free spiritness if that makes sense, 
like you're running a big company and there's this huge ship and you're on the ocean and there's no turning back. And then I'm like, Hey, what's going on over there? <laughs> and I'm on this little jet ski, you know, just like, this looks crazy. <laughs> you're yeah. pulling up to the yacht on the little jet ski. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, Hey guys, what's up? Um, and there was a level of that, that actually ended up um, revealing to me what I think was like this, the, the, one of the deepest signals that happened through the acquisition was um, he taught me and continues to teach me what it's like to be a founder led company. Mm-hmm. Like it's truly he and Mike, the co-founders driving this whole, this whole boat. Um, they're not doing anything where they're like, oh, let's have other people come in and like, tell us what they think we should do. That did happen just to be clear. Right. Like after fundraising, it was like, yo, I don't really know. Uh, this is kind of a new territory. What should we do? And then yeah. you hire people who've done it before, but they ended up jumping right back into the driver's seat and um, embodying this concept of a trim tab that I wrote in the show notes and have studied quite a bit. Um, have you heard of trim tabs? Mm-mm. What is yeah, that? Dude, it blows my mind that not many people know about it. Buckminster Fuller, who is like the Leonardo da Vinci of America. This guy is the one that created the buckyball, like their geodesic dome. This guy's amazing. Yep. So savage. Um, on his tombstone, it reads Bucky Trim Tab Fuller. And it's like, if someone's going to put that on their tombstone, it probably means something, right? So I, I, um, I looked into it. I know Sheena and I talked about it quite a bit. A uh, trim tab is basically someone who has the ability to, um, well, what it technically is, by the way, is on that big ship that I was passing on the jet ski. Yeah. It's this little tab that sits on the rudder. So oh, that's, all that's, it that's right. And, but it's so important. Like if it's, you don't have the trim tab, yeah. you're screwed, basically. You're screwed. And it was, uh, this is where we go off into the Wikipedia world or whatever. But <laughs> it was... Um, I think an innovation that happened within World War II because it became so much more important to like reroute things once you got the information that like it was not the right direction to be going in. You can just think about that metaphorically, right? It's like a huge thing that has a ton of value on it is moving in a direction. And then what if it's the wrong direction? Like how do you change that? And uh, how you change that is this trim tab, which is this small thing that sticks on the rudder creates a lot of pressure on the other side of it that it then allows the the massive ship to turn far more efficiently and Oshin and mike totally embody that like they saw all these headwinds with apple and idfa they saw that things weren't going the direction they wanted to with i guess leadership that was brought on after the series b fundraising they just saw where everything was going on that mm-hmm. ship and they both were just like let's go <laughs> like and um you know i'm 30 years old they're a little older than me right and there's parts of me that always thinks that like i just have no idea how they have this energy but they care so much they honestly care so much these guys they're working every weekend you know they're obsessing at five in the morning all these things because again they're this little trim tab that just knows that they need to be making these consistent decisions to make sure that we're headed in the right direction and it was I think the combination of this massive organization with this like individually high integrity led leadership group that was like, yeah, I need to learn about that. I think the the funniest thing for me was at ChargeX last year um, at the speaker dinner. Like I I, I hadn't met Oshin yet at that point. Um, And I like sat down for dinner or whatever. And like this, like, just random guy sits next to me on on my left and he just looked like some run-of-the-mill person like whatever um yeah we all just yeah. had the dinner um we we're having fun i've probably made some jokes that i maybe wouldn't have made if i knew that it was him um <laughs> at the end he's like oh oh yeah maybe bags or something but i don't remember but at the end then it was like holy shit like that was Oshin. and like now i've met him a lot more and like in more but it was just it was really funny. He's just so, yeah. Um, and he was, yeah. really, he was really just sitting there and I can almost tell that like, yeah, we were at like a dinner, but he also was like listening in a way that yeah. made me sort of think he was listening, thinking about recharge the whole time while we were having these conversations <laughs> about commerce and whatever else. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it was, it it was is. Just really amusing for me. 
It's totally true. One a little anecdote, and I feel so embarrassed about this one. Like I had bought a new car, um, actually prior to the acquisition, but it's like uh, whatever, and I'm like matted it out and whatever because I love wearing black, blah blah blah. And um, I I was so nervous because I we go on a lot of walks, Oshin and I, for him to see this car because I thought he was gonna think I bought it with like the acquisition, you know, cash, <laughs> which I didn't because he drives a Prius. Like yes. he drives, he's, it's just like the run of the mill Prius. And so I mean, <laughs> the longest time I was like parking three blocks away before we get on these walks and whatnot, just so that he didn't think I was like trying to one up him with the car or anything. And then one day we passed the car and he, he did the whole like, whoa, it's a cool car. I was like, that's my car. <laughs> that's my car, actually. He's like, oh, that, and he was just so happy. And he's like, oh, man. And he starts telling about how eventually there, he will move past the Prius. But <laughs> to your point, truly just obsessed with recharge and doing what's right by the customer. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, um, I still have like a thousand more questions that I need to ask you, but um, we can only take this episode so long, unfortunately. Um, so we'll have to do we'll have to do another one for sure. Um, is there anything else though, like sort of last things that you wanted to cover or touch off on um, before we hop in? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, this is going to sound just so, I guess, like everyone's saying this, but you know, if people are listening to this recently, if it's April, or whatever, while, while they're reading it, um, you have to start learning more about large language models and AI. Like if you're in technology or not, you have to like it is the most important thing that you could be spending your extra time doing right now i'm gonna add it to my to-do list i got minescence trim tab yeah llms <laughs> llms <laughs> it's a nice sandwich i now know yeah. what my week i now know what my weekend is going to be listening to music learning about llms oh yeah move d we got move d in there too oh, that's right yeah. all right i need to <laughs> One of my, uh, this city that I've moved to is just ridiculous. And one of my favorite um, DJs is coming Sunday night and he comes on stage at four in the morning, uh, Monday morning. Oh. Like what the, f who, who can do this? Like I live in a city wow. of just, like excess and nobody works, I guess. Uh, like no. I can't see this. It's just no. it's painful. You should go to bed and then wake up at like three 30 and then go on a run and then get hyped up and then keep going on your run right that's the they, idea they literally sell entry after 7 a.m tickets oh my god because it'll go to like <laughs> 1 or 2 p.m maybe i'll do our all team meeting at 12 o'clock like from dance floor <laughs> that sounds great i mean i i would expect that from you actually <laughs> i think you do, i think you do it i i might actually give it a try i still haven't decided yet but we'll see we'll see well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I definitely want to chat again because we want to get more into like building a team and and some of the more, I would say, entrepreneurial side of things. But thanks for coming on. Um, before we off, off, can you let people know where they can find you uh, online? Yeah, um, this has been great. We we'll love around too. Uh, I don't really use Twitter that much, but if there were to be a Twitter, West Magnus, W-E-S, and then LinkedIn for sure. Um, LinkedIn's been like the most used social network for me in the past two years. So LinkedIn in Wesley Magnus, M-A-G-N-E-S-S. -S. Awesome. I'll drop it in the show notes. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. As always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Okay.